So round two was 73 projects, 93.7 million, creating 817 jobs. Um, and round three, uh, which we just finished, was 79 projects, 66.9 million dollars in state funding creating 810 jobs. Um, so significant job creation numbers, even though we were about 30 million less uh, in state funding. Um, on the whole, uh, when we look at all three rounds for Central New York, um, 226 total projects, $264 million in state funding, created 2,224 direct jobs. And here's some of the other interesting information. We retained over 1,420 jobs. So some of these weren't just job generating projects, they were job retention projects. Um, and, and the two numbers that are most astounding to me, almost 18,000 construction jobs were created as a part of this process, and $1.138 billion of private investment was made in Central New York over the last three years through those three rounds of uh, regional council funding. Um, what does that mean for Cuba County? What were the Cuba County numbers? Well, round one was kind of our, uh, our, our shining star in terms of the three rounds. Uh, we had 13 different projects, total $12.6 million, creating about 184 jobs uh, just from those round one projects. Obviously, a big part of that um, was the Cuban Milk Ingredients Project. A significant portion of that funding was for that, as well as some interesting um, housing projects that actually aren't part of the Regional Council process anymore. They pulled that out of that CFA consolidated funding application process. But that was two of the main reasons why we did so well in round number one. In round number two, um, we had eight projects that were funded. It totaled almost $2 million for Cuba County and state funds, created about 36 jobs. Uh, and then in round three, once again, eight projects, uh, about $1.6 million uh, from state funding, so less than round two, but created over uh, right around 100 jobs. So, um, and actually, I believe that number is going to move back up to 1.9. We've got a project that may receive some additional funding after the initial announcement. So, uh, we may be on par with round three and round two in terms of dollars, state dollars that are coming from Cuba County. So, it's been very good for us. You know, one of the things I always want to make sure people understand is that, well, two things. One, this whole process has, has not necessarily been just about the money. It's about coming together as a region, creating a strategy, creating a strategy plan, saying what are our strengths, what are our opportunities, where are we going to see the most growth, how do we mitigate some of our weaknesses, and that's been extremely valuable, um, because these aren't the only projects that are happening, it's not like stuff has to happen in the CFA for, for business to grow. Jobs are growing, people are opening their own businesses, um, expansions are happening sometimes without state assistance, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's very encouraging to hear that. And the other thing is, is that, you know, a lot has been made about these regional economic development councils. This isn't necessarily new money that the state has been giving out. This is just a new way, a new process that they've done it. So previously, as a community, we have been attracting state resources into our community. We've been bringing in Empire State Development grant dollars. We've been uh, part of the, previously it was the Empire Zone program. Our community benefited significantly from the Empire Zone program. So, you know, it's not like suddenly the REDCs were brought online and we became a, a player with the state. I mean, our our economic development work that's been going on with the county and the city um, has been accessing those resources all along. It's just now we've got a stronger voice. Um, we've got a stronger voice because of the process that's put in place with the regional councils, that it's really more of a ground up. Now, I won't st stand up here and tell you that it's a completely unpolitical process now. It's, it's all about the merit of the projects and all about the merit of the plan because there is still obviously some politics that come into play um, in the process. Um, and that is going to be, I think, a little bit more evident, uh, at least in terms of the timing in round four. So round four is anticipated. Um, what has to happen first is the budget needs to pass, which I uh, will be shocked and surprised if it doesn't pass on time this year uh, in April. Uh, they will likely open up the consolidated funding application process in May. Um, for applicants to begin filling that out. Um, theoretically, you can go on now and begin filling out that application, <clears throat> but the new programs aren't in there yet, so you wouldn't be able to select those programs. And I'm not sure if you can take the old application and port it to the new, new funding opportunities when they come out. But that will all be announced in May. Um, the submission deadline last year was in July. I am anticipating it will probably be sometime in June this year so that we can have our priority projects from the council submitted to the state. Last year we needed to put them in in September. I'm assuming we will need to put them in in August. And unlike last year when the announcement was in December, I am anticipating that the announcement will likely be in October this year. Um, and for 
any of you that understand what's happening in the political realm right now, it is a significant election year. Uh, and so the likelihood is, is that those announcements will be made prior to the November uh, first Tuesday of November elections. Uh, that's, the, that's the word that we're somewhat hearing. Nothing official yet, um, but uh, likely that will happen in round four. So uh, we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to helping uh, applicants through that process, bringing projects uh, forward to the regional council. Um, helping people align themselves with the strategies that we have in place. So that's the update on the REDC. Uh, if you have any questions on that, we'll wait till the end. Be happy to answer questions on that or on the uh, one-stop discussion at that time. So Guy mentioned I have um, two of my three board chairs with me and one of my vice chairs sitting in for the chair. Uh, Dave Tehan, uh, who is the uh, chair of the chamber. Uh, Kelly Gridley, who is the chair of CETA. And Chris Alger, who is the vice chair of Q Strategic Solutions. And if you're wondering what Q Strategic Solutions is, we'll explain that to you here shortly. But I'm going to first start off, um, give you a little um, overview of what we're going to do. We're going to take you through a timeline. As Guy said, there's been a lot of discussions over the last six to seven years. Really, there's been a lot of discussions over the last 40 to 50 years about economic development and how do we do this. We're not going to give you a history lesson here, but we are going to go back to what I believe, uh, what I view as a crucial point um, in this discussion, and that was a uh, well, I'll let Kelly talk to you about that, but we're going to go back all the way to 2009. So Kelly's going to present first, and I'll have her come up here, and we'll take you through the timeline. We'll then talk to you about the organizational structure that's in place now, and uh, talk to you about the services that we have available now to one stop. So, uh, Kelly? Thank you. On July 25th, 2009, this forum was organized by the County Planning and Economic Development and the County Legislature. Many of you in this room probably attended that forum. Out of the forum, a decision was made to turn CETA into a reality. The county legislature approved funding, which was initially a three-year funding um, for 2010-11 and 12, and has since been extended in one-year increments for 2013 and 2014. Initially, CETA was set up as a first stop, being the first point of contact for clients, helping point them to, to other agencies as needed. Even though the forum had clear direction in wanting a one stop, establishing CETA as a first stop was a good starting point. So today's going to take you through the next couple of things. I did want to expand a little bit on what Kelly was saying in terms of the formation of CETA. One of the things that was very intentional about CETA's formation was its board structure. Um, it was a public-private entity that had uh, members of the, pro of the public sector on the board uh, with a majority of the private sector in control of the board and, and, and putting itself in place. So there's six members by title on the CETA board. Um, and so that was, again, very intentional. And so that's, that's an important component of this discussion that we're having here. So David's going to take the next section. So as this all proceeded, uh, the chamber went through some strategic planning. And part of the discussions that we had as the board of the chamber was we wanted to move past being perceived as something of a social organization because that is just a function of the chamber is to get the uh, business people in the community together. Um, but part of the other parts of the mission also include um, advocating within the community, within uh, to not just the local but also the state level government uh, for the business community, and then also to facilitate collaboration, um, supporting the economic development of the region. So when the opportunity came about to move to the uh, Stardust Building on Two State Street, the idea would be the chamber would be a little bit more centrally located now. Where it was before on South Street, you know, wasn't necessarily that we were out in the sticks, mind you, um, but it seemed as we were kind of off to the side, uh, moving more into a, a central uh, downtown location allowed for uh, the idea of collaboration with other agencies, some co-location, which had ended up occurring with CETA when CETA moved in as a tenant. So. Now you have these two organizations that can work closely together to utilize each other's contacts um, and each other's knowledge uh, to promote economic development. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's starting to, uh, to, to prove true. 
uh, additionally uh, and um, concurrently, it was around that time that the, uh, the governor in 2011 created the REBCs. Now, the uh, Regional Economic Development Councils uh, is a statewide uh, run program, uh, but there are 10 regional councils which were tasked with developing long-term strategic plans for economic growth for their regions. The councils are public and private uh, partnerships made up of local experts and representatives from business, uh, the academic world, uh, local governments, and uh, not-for-profits. The, uh, the idea is that they produce the uh, plans and um, implement agendas that reflect uh, the distinct characteristics of each of the ten regions. Now, more to the point for the, uh, for the central region, which includes uh, Syracuse, Onondaga County, Cuban County naturally, uh, also Portland, Madison, and Oswego, there was a, a collaboration uh, from our representatives that went to the regional uh, council that allowed for us to do some key focus points for Cuban County, which included the food to markets. Obviously, there's a strong agricultural uh, base here in Cuban County. So one of the ideas is that we needed to support the locally grown products. Uh, there's the tourism, arts, and culture, uh, which is uh, making a huge try. We're actually sitting uh, in the building which reflects uh, the arts and culture aspect of Cuba County. Uh, and even just as important, the municipal core reinvestment uh, and also educational initiatives. Uh, a lot of the big strides are being made uh, in, in Cuba County, uh, and I think these uh, economic Excuse me, the Economic Development Council has been a huge benefit to us. So, one of the first things CETA was charged to do was a countywide strategic plan for economic development. This plan identified that in order for CETA to be successful, it would need to function as a one stop rather than a first stop, becoming a single point of contact being the only point of contact to see if it then interact on the client's behalf with other agencies. Quite a bit of work has been done over the years to transition CETA to a true one-stop. As Guy said, CETA's executive director resigned in the fall of 2012 and left the board to look at how we would move forward. CETA had been subletting the space from the chamber. The chamber executive director sat on CETA's board as a couple of Board of Directors on the team report. So it seemed a natural progression to explore a MOU between the Chamber and CEDAW, whereby CEDAW would contract with the Chamber for their Executive Director to serve on an interim basis as the Executive Director of CEDAW. Good morning. I'd like to present an overview of the strategic partnership process between CEDAW and the Chamber. So on the heels of successful shared executive director services and touchdown between CETA and the Chamber, it became more evident than ever there were some major opportunities to capitalize upon these two organizations based on the complementary missions as well as certain overlaps between the program services that were offered, which we'll get into in more detail coming up on the day. Now we have here the matrix of the program services offered by both the Chamber and CETA. You'll see particularly with regard to economic development and advocacy, we have specific overlaps in the services offered. Um, this is one of the guiding principles and why we partnership committee and explore some opportunities to capitalize on these complementary missions. So based on um, the identification of these opportunities, both organizations approved the appointment of the strategic partnership committee early on in spring 2013. This consisted of members of the executive committees of both organizations. Um, what they did is explore the, the best possible options to capitalize on these opportunities, keeping three important goals in mind. That is to maintain the autonomy of each organization, particularly with the governance structures and the program services being offered. Um, as well as to maintain the current services and improve upon them um, to their members and stakeholders, while improving upon the overall operating effectiveness and efficiency through cost savings. Now, with these, with these goals in mind, the Strategic Partnership Committee came with four specific options. The first of which involved maintaining the organizations as is, with no significant 
um, processes in place to improve upon collaboration. The second of which also involved separate operations by each organization, but they would independently come up with their own measures to um, prevent some of these overlaps and improve upon cost savings. The third of which is the consolidation and merger of both organizations into one um, unique entity. And the fourth was a joint venture arrangement between the two organizations, which would create a new nonprofit entity that serves a vehicle for this collaboration and cost savings between the two organizations. Upon exploring these four options, the first two were a bit too conservative. It really didn't feel as a committee that these capitalized on the opportunities that present themselves to improve the efficiency of both organizations. The third of which was on the other end of the spectrum, a bit too aggressive, um, with one single entity that would pretty much eliminate um, one organization or the other in terms of their um, autonomy and overall governance structure. And what the committee um, ended up settling on was the fourth option, which we recommended the boards in late summer of 2013, and that was a joint venture between the two entities. And that resulted in a brand new nonprofit, 501c6 Corporation, Key Strategic Solutions, which was the board was consisted of executive committee members of both organizations at that time. And um, I'll turn it over to Dave now to get into a little bit more on how those structures will work. So, this is where the attorney gets to worry about the legalese. <laughs> <laughs> so, once the decision was made to move towards a a, a not-for-profit structure, uh, we had to figure out how that would work, and we somewhat modeled it off of what was done with respect to the um, Center State, thank you very much, where Center State was created with the model of the uh, Syracuse Chamber and the MBA, and so we somewhat modified that structure where we created a not-for-profit where the chamber and the CETA would both be the members of this new not-for-profit. So it allowed the two different organizations to maintain their own structure while creating another not-for-profit organization. And we uh, had to get the Attorney General's approval on this, which we were fortunately able to obtain in January. Once we had that, we were uh, filed and on record with uh, New York State, I believe it was January 16th, as a not-for-profit. So, what we've been able to do is keep two separate and distinct organizations providing manpower and assets towards one common goal, and that is to attract, grow, and expand businesses in Cuyahoga County, creating jobs, and improving the quality of life for everyone. And so this is, a little, uh, I guess, the best illustration of how this uh, structure looks. Uh, noting that the, uh, the Chamber and CETA are uh, connected to the CSS, uh, Cuba Strategic Solutions as the members. Both organizations share the executive director, uh, and then uh, the uh, two uh, positions uh, that report to the executive director, yet Chamber and CETA still maintain their own employees uh, and functions. Uh, and what we've been able to do, as it was pointed out with that uh, chart that Chris had, is we were able to eliminate the duplicative services and figure out which of the organizations was best was the best fit to fill the various uh, uh, operations that, and functions that were needed. And uh, I think at this point I'm done. I'll turn it over back to Andrew. Thank you very much. So a couple of other things I want to point out. Um, as you look at this chart, uh, you probably have some questions about, you know, why did we create another board that's more meetings? Are you crazy? Well, we all know the answer to that is yes. But um, the reality of it is, is that for the, the year and a few months that I was interim director, this new structure actually is less meetings than I was having before because uh, if you didn't hear it before, the CSS board is the executive committees of the chamber and the CETA board. And so previously, I was having executive committees every month. I was having full board meetings every month of each of these two organizations. So I was having four of the many meetings I have uh, every month. Now I have three because as this board meets, we also serve as the executive committees for those boards separately do a little business before and a little business after for each of the organizations, but ultimately we're working together in a partnership in this situation. And the body of work that's for the chamber, which is the member services and the advocacy component, is still is still over, oversaw, <coughs> overseen 
governed by the Chamber Board and all of the economic development activities um, that are carried out by these staff members are overseen by the CETA Board. The other thing to note there, we have contractual relationships through CETA with Cuba County and the Cuba County IDA. Uh, with Cuba County, that's how our contract is in place for providing one-stop services, economic development one-stop services, and the contract with the IDA is to provide them staff services so that we have those um, <clears throat> tools, if you will, for economic development all being delivered by one set of staff. And then these three, shipped, these three staff members here, again, provide services to both organizations on the function of office manager and communication coordinator, um, and, and then the executive director. So the question then is, that's great. What does that really mean? What are you, what are you actually able to do now that you're a one-stop? So what I want to talk to you a little bit about is the services that we provide. And I've got a couple of slides here with list, which list all of the things that we can now provide in the business. But the, the bottom line, and I'm not going to read all of this for, to you, you're, you're perfectly capable of that. But the bottom line is, is that we believe now um, we have the resources in place to help anyone that walks through our door in some <coughs> way, shape, or form. Whether that is the entrepreneur who thinks, you know what, I, I have a really great recipe for, uh, for cookies and I, I want to start my own little bake shop to the, uh, you know, to the, to the new cores and the OIs of the world who say, hey, our corporate headquarters are looking at a major expansion somewhere in North America. Why not here? How can you help us make that a reality? So everything in between um, is, is something that we can provide. And we can do that through a variety of things. Um, we have services that provide just basic growth and profitability. This is, not a, this is outside of just a general project. This is connecting people with uh, some of the cost savings programs that we have with the chamber that helps with the bottom line, helping them network within the industry and finding opportunities to do business with other local businesses that they don't have the time to get out and figure out on their own because they're too busy running their business and working in their business to do some of those things, and connecting them with some of our uh, technical assistants that are uh, available through the region, through the state, through federal government in terms of ways in which they can improve upon their processes, improve upon their operations, become more efficient. Specific project assistance. This is something that gets a lot of the, the glamour and a lot of the press and a lot of the attention. But you know, really, we do a lot more of these two things than we do the project assistance. But when I get up here and talk to you about the Economic Development Council and all the millions of dollars, that's great. Um, but the one thing to remember is that $1.3 billion that we talked about is in light of the fact that Central New York has an annual economy of about $33 billion. And so if we're not maintaining that, and we worry about the $1.3 billion that is invested over a three-year period and focus solely on that and miss the fact that we've got to be nurturing and growing that $33 billion that's already here, we're going to be missing the boat. But the project assistance we have in place, financing assistance, working with our local partners, working with some state programs, working with the SBA, the 504 programs, all those things that are out there, the county loan programs, the city loan programs, uh, there's a lot of opportunities that are there, and you can find creative ways to work with the company to help finance the project. Um, accessing local, regional, and state incentive programs, IDA assistance that really is tax abatement, um, whether it's through mortgage recorded tax, sales and use tax exemptions, payment in lieu of tax agreements, um, or bonds that are able to be accessed that are tax exempt. So again, all very much uh, tax incentive based. Um, and then also timeline and strategic planning. We'll, we'll, we'll work with a company that's saying, you know, I think I'm ready to grow, but I don't even know where to start. I'm not even sure how I'm going to do this, but I've got this potential contract. And so even if we don't have the expertise, <coughs> now, so we'll connect them with the folks that can do those things. So I said I wasn't going to read it, and I did. Sorry. Um, so education and advocacy, again, you can see all the things that we do there through regional promotion, uh, policy and regulation, education, leadership training, through our leadership future program, and those kind of things. So those are the one-stop services that we have available to existing businesses. Um, and so, and again, that's everything from the corner store uh, to, uh, you know, the, to Mackenzie Childs to, um, you know, Pleasant Beach Hotel in Fairhaven to Raymond Farms down in Genoa. It's everything in between. Um, so then the new businesses, what, what do we have available for that? Relocation and attraction. Um, this is something that... Um, we have been more reactive in the past because of just the setup that we have and we're looking to be a little bit more proactive in terms of this opportunity. Um, relocation and attraction prior has been if someone calls for a specific site need, we'll, we'll respond to that to the state and say, hey, we've got this site that might be available, you should take a look at it. Um, but really we're going to be looking at doing some more targeted approach to this. 
Um, we're going to be uh, heavily working with our existing businesses and finding out really what's their supply chain look like, both up and down. Who are they getting their raw materials from? Who are they selling their end products from to? And we're going to build that database. Um, and as that database gets populated, we're going to be able to discover some really clear opportunities. Opportunities that say, wow, every single one of our plastics manufacturers in this community have XYZ supplier. And when we did some data mining on XYZ supplier, we found out that that actually accounts for 50% you know, of their book of business. Well, if we can move them closer to 50% of their book of business, that's a significant savings for them. And it's also a significant savings for our existing businesses. And so we'll be doing some market analysis on that. We'll be able to find ways in which we can go and, and targetedly talk to that company and ask them to consider looking at Cuyahoga County uh, to, to relocate or expand into um, whichever is going to make the most sense for them. New venture, this is entrepreneurial assistance. Um, or it can also be spin-off assistance where you've got an existing company looking at a new product line. They may not want to take it on, but they may have the manpower on board that's interested in it. And they're more than willing to help support those, those individuals start that new product line. And so we've got different areas of, of expertise that we can provide them with services. And then community resources in general that we offer through the One Stop. We have the Grants Information Center. Um, we have our Young Professionals Group Ignite. We've got currently Navigator Services for sole proprietors and small businesses. That's the healthcare exchange. Um, we have two Navigators on staff who can provide small businesses and sole proprietors access to the New York State of Health marketplace and in leadership at UGO. So those are the services that we offer. So again, that is a lot of fancy words, a lot of different things, but what does it ultimately boil down to? Ultimately what it boils down to is the philosophy that, that, that the CETA board and the chamber both have said, look, this is, how, this is who we want to be as economic development. This is how we want to conduct ourselves. Um, and, and this is how we want to proceed is a three-step process. And no matter what we're looking at, no matter what those scenarios are, this three-step process is what it is. We're going to listen. Um, we're going to listen to the opportunity. We're going to listen to the challenge. We're going to listen to uh, the complaint. We're going to listen to the concern. We're going to listen to whatever it is that that business, that individual, uh, that company has uh, for, for their existing situation. And then we're going to take the time to assess, assess, there we go, too much transitions here. It's not worth it. Um, we're going to take the time to assess that opportunity to assess that issue, to assess that challenge, and figure out what could be a solution for them. Is it something that we have in-house in terms of within Cuba County? Is it something that we have within the region? Is it something that we have within the state? What's going to be the best solution for that individual? Is it connecting them with another business that has the answer or, or what? And then there it is, connect. Um, and that's the final thing that we do is we connect them to that resource. Uh, whatever that resource is, we're going to connect them to it. Um, and so that's kind of the, the philosophy that we bring to the table, um, no matter what we're doing in terms of sitting down with uh, an entrepreneur or sitting down with a CEO. Um, that's the process we want to take them through. So that's what, um, you know, that's what the, the one-stop services look like and, and what they, what they uh, are. So questions for us. That's, that's our presentation on the one-stop. Again, this is not something that really happened. All of you in the room had some part to play in this. Uh, whether it be conversations that you had uh, with your representatives, whether it be work on the ground that you did, um, you know, really, uh, you know, my board has a, has a tremendous impact on this. All the boards, um, you know, as well as uh, you know, work that the county did, particularly Steve Lynch and all of his work in setting CETA up in the beginning. Um, and uh, you know, this has just been a great experience for me. Uh, I think it's it's been an, uh, it's been it's been perfect timing because I think what I've been hearing from all of you is the community was ready for this and uh, we need it, and you know, it's what is being done all around us, and if we're not able to compete just with our neighbors, it's going to be very challenging for us to compete uh, with other states and other communities uh, outside of Central New York. Does the new organization have its own staff? So, CSS, all of these individuals are employees of CSS. The Chamber and CETA no longer have employees. They have a memorandum of understanding between the Cuba Strategic Solutions entity to provide staff services. So we've consolidated payroll, uh, consolidated systems in-house, um, and so CETA no longer runs payroll, the Chamber no longer runs payroll. They have a memorandum of understanding with each other that forms CSS to align their staff services under one 
profit to, to provide them with those staff services. So Sorry? What is ultimately stopping getting rid of the chamber and CETA and becoming one entity? So um, that's a very good question. Um, and I don't know if either of you want to field that. I'm certainly willing to. I don't want to be the one you're talking about. Um, so when, I mentioned this before. When CETA was created, it's a 501c3. It's, an, it's a local development corporation. And it specifically has a very uh, intentional board structure of those six people by title and then the nine private sector individuals. It's a 15 member board. The chamber is a 501c6, which means it's a membership organization. It's organized by its members. And so if you were to consolidate or merge those two organizations, um, you know, first of all, that's challenging in a lot of ways because you have a nascent organization that's really been around for three years. You have an organization that's been around for 100 years. Who becomes the lead? Where does that go? But ultimately, it came down to the legal issues. If we consolidate it, we become a 501c3, which would allow us to continue to maintain a contract with the county, continue to uh, receive you know, grants from uh, you know, philanthropic organizations and those kind of things, or to become a 501c6, which allows us to maintain our membership base, which is also a significant portion of our funding. And so to consolidate and merge ultimately into one organization, you would lose one or the other of those aspects. And so this provided us the vehicle to align those staff without losing the integrity of those structures. And, and the thing that Center State CEO did that people need to understand is those were two 501c6 organizations that merged. Now, interestingly enough, on the face of things, what they did was became one new organization, but the legal structure was actually the exact same. They had existing contracts that the Chamber had and the MBA had that prevented them from merging into one organization. Eventually, they will probably go that route as these other ex contracts expire, but they actually created a new 501c6. They just have a 74-person board and everyone on the Chamber and on the MDA and on the Center State Board are all the same people. So, hopefully that answers your question. But from the outside, that last slide that you showed with all those different brand things, you know, so from the outside of people looking in, though, now, and Syracuse is a good example, people don't talk about the MBA or the chamber anymore, they only identify the center state CEO. So will that be the case going forward that you're going to kind of slow up to move away from these brand logos and it's going to be CSS, even though the structure underneath it um, legally is in place differently? Because I think from the outside, that's where you I think the short answer to that is not likely. Um, what our discussions have been around is the fact that there is still, even though there was a lot of overlap, there's still significant enough differentiation and mission. Now, now, to your point, will the chamber ever go away? Will that ever go away? The answer to that is not likely. Will we create some unified brand up front that people can look at and say, oh, this is who I need to call for all these things? And perhaps one of the things that as an organization we're looking at doing is uh, going through some significant strategic planning again this year um, for all three organizations, both individually for the two and then collectively for all of them, to talk about those very specific questions um, because, you know, there's a couple of key things that I think the board has wanted to answer. I don't want to speak for any of them, so feel free to jump up here if you want. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, that, that's a key question that we have to ask ourselves. But from the chamber perspective, again, we are a member-driven uh, organization, providing services to its to its members, and the structure of seed is a little bit different. Being, a, as we mentioned, a five hundred one c three, funding coming from a different section. So, um, the individual missions of both organizations have not changed. Uh, most of the functions of the individual organizations have not changed uh, other than to figure out which of these two organizations is the better fit to run uh, various uh, functions. Again, the Chamber still will have its uh, the member benefits, the, the advocacy uh, within the community, within uh, not just on the uh, local stage but also on the uh, at the state level, uh, the chambers had a, uh, a lot of um, uh, activity in that particular region. So, um, hopefully, someone, we're not. Someone calls and you, you answer the phone. You, the county chamber of commerce, can you get another phone? That's what you're going to do for a while. So, what, how that's going to work, the logistics, that's a very valid point. Um, we're working on consolidating the phone system right now. CETA still has its number 2523500. The chamber has its number 2527291. What's going to happen is the staff are going to be able to see what line that's coming in on. 
every one of those 10 people will be able to see what call is coming in on. Now the main point of contact for the phones is the communication coordinator. And we have rollover so if there's other people that need to answer it because they're on lunch or whatever, they will all know and understand, oh, this is a CETA call, QVAC Non Development Agency, how can I help you? Now, if that changes down the road, there is the potential for that. It may be the Cayuga County one stop. We, we don't know, but that's a conversation we have to have internally as an entire group. That wasn't a, that wasn't a solution that I felt was able to be had. Any other than Is this type of uh, coalition of services something that you think is happening, not just here in Syracuse, but maybe across the region or state or country? Is this um, a trend, in other words? Absolutely. Consolidation and uh, collaboration is the trend. Um, it, it, it's something that, to be honest, we should always have been doing. Um, but when we all had access to our own private funding streams, we weren't willing to. Um, and so that's being driven now by a lack of availability of funding. And so that's happening more and more as a result of that. Um, but the truth is, it's a much more efficient way to do things, and you're able to put more dollars into programming and reduce overhead. And so um, that's being looked at all over the country, all over the state. So the short answer is yes. If you're asking me specifically, is there, is there, a, uh, is there a situation like this, where there's a chamber and an EDA and an IDA partnering with the EDA and a county partnering with an EDA, that's a little bit more rare, but that um, what we think is Auburn and Cuyahoga County have always been on the cutting edge of some of these things over the last hundred years, so let's do it again. Dan. Where does the city of Auburn fit in? Uh, the city of Auburn, uh, we're in dialogue and conversation with them right now. Um, from CETA's perspective, we're providing economic development services for the city because the county the city is in the county and the county's contracted with us and they didn't contract with us and say, we want you to provide economic development for Cuyahoga County, but here's the border of the city and you know they're not contracting with you, so leave that out of it. That was never part of the discussion. Um, what I will say is that the city has its own idea um, and we're currently in discussions with them about um, having CETA also provide staff services for them. And we've built in our capacity the opportunity to do that. They have just had a whole bunch of new board members come on. Uh, I believe four new members come on. They had an organizational meeting in January. We've been discussing this with them since probably October of last year, if not earlier. Um, and there's a significant level of interest from them. Uh, what we're talking about right now is either a transition in April after the Paris reporting is due, which is the state reporting system for all public authorities that, that deal with tax incentives, um, or uh, sometime in the summertime, depending upon when it makes the most sense for them. In addition to that, uh, City Council just approved the uh, update to the CDBG plan, um, and there was some language in there that we worked on collaboratively about uh, possibly looking at having some of those functions, particularly the Small Business Assistance Program, which is the city's loan program, having the administration of that move to CETA and some of those other things as a part of the CDBG plan itself. So ultimately, we anticipate that the city will be a partner in this in this collaboration by the end. Um, one of the things I just want to speak to a little bit, I run the uh, um, restaurants and inns down in Aurora, New York, and we've used CETA through this structure has been very effective in terms of developing our businesses down there. And one of the things, and, and again, I've been down there for about 12 years operating businesses, but with the, with the formation of CETA and what we've been able to do, we were able to partner and get um, some very important tax incentives through CCIDA for our most recent in um, that we're developing down there, as well as some regional economic development council money for the development. So in other words, we got a grant, and CETA was key in helping us fill out those forms and get this. We got a $250,000 grant that really allowed us to go forward with an $8 million project down there with outside money coming in. Most of you guys probably know our company was sold from Wells College to Pleasant Rowland just a little over a month ago. But that money, that quarter million dollars we got, plus the tax incentives, not only allowed her to go forward with that particular project, but quite frankly, we're talking about another $20 million with the projects down there. That would not have happened if there hadn't been this coordination of efforts. And it made it really easy from a business standpoint to figure out where to go, how to get this money, and how to move forward. So the power, in my opinion, of what this is able to do is incredible. 
in the chamber piece, obviously bringing along a lot of important um, member benefits. So things like the multiple employer plan for 401ks if you're trying to run small businesses like ours. Those are really important. So this partnership here, I think, really sets the stage well for all of us who are trying to build our businesses and develop those and connect us with those resources to help us grow. I mean, clearly a $250,000 grant likely is going to leverage itself into over $20 million of new development in Cuba County. That would not have happened um, in there. So again, I've seen personally how this impacts a business and, and our business down there. And I would encourage folks to really contact, because there's a lot out there that's so easy to do now, or much easier to do than it was even five years ago. Uh, Back to the REDC, I was wondering if you uh, could recall, by memory, um, the nature of those jobs that were created, the 100% jobs. Are they service, manufacturing, are they salaried? So over the three rounds, we've had about 320 jobs created in the county. Um, I would say what you would expect based upon our existing economy is, is extrapolated out into those jobs. Uh, I would say probably about a third of them are in the tourism industry, um, and so those are going to be, uh, and, but those are all over the place. It's not just frontline staff, it's support staff, and it's, it's you know, the, the median wage, I think, in tourism is 28, 31, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, uh, probably about uh, half of those are going to be in uh, manufacturing, um, where you have a much higher uh, median wage there, um, and then the other... Uh, if I can do my math accurately, uh, one sixth. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever the rest of that portion is, it's made up of various different things: healthcare, uh, professional services. Those kinds of things. I have a, a bias. I've been trying to get past when you're talking about this, and it, it has to do with what the region is that this is being described to be part of. Uh, I see Syracuse as a uh, an overwhelming weight, only overwhelming center of this uh, economic development, and I don't see a lot of in common between Auburn and these other communities that are in the Syracuse area. These other communities are basically suburbs, economic suburbs, to this center, and Cuga County, I don't think is. When I see commonality in Cuga County, particularly we talk about the tourism. I'm thinking we have much more in common with those areas to the west of us than to the east of us. And I'm wondering whether this makes a difference in terms of, you know, this is a little, you know, in terms of the region that we're considered to be part of. When you're communicating, are you communicating with Syracuse? Are you communicating with Ithaca, uh, Geneva, Canandaigua, places that we really have much more in common with? The answer is yes to both of those. Um, I don't know, Meg, if you want to say anything about it, but this, is, this, has, been a, this has been a thorn in our side from the beginning. Uh, interestingly enough, we are actually part of the Finger Lakes tourism region um, because the state doesn't have the tourism regions overlapping the same way as the, as the REDC regions. And so while we are part of the REDC for the economic development purposes, we are part of the Finger Lakes in terms of tourism and branding and, and all of those things. Tourism and, so, and Auburn began, tourism in the Finger Lakes began in Auburn, that membership organization now in Penn Yen, started in Auburn by the city manager in Auburn. So, you know, it, it, it's something that actually a lot of people are saying, boy, isn't this a challenge? And in some respects it is, but I see it as a tremendous opportunity because it allows us to kind of be the gateway between those two regions. It allows us to leverage the best of both worlds. We can tap into the REDC and the work that's being done on the export initiative and the work that's being done on uh, you know, the, the work for the, the Metropolitan Business Plan and what that means and, and, and also the work that's being done through Central New York that's reaching out into the Mohawk Valley in terms of the new air, which is the drone test site that's going to be coming online in Utica. But it then also allows us to still remain grounded in the fact that we're in wine country, we're in lake country. Uh, and, and we can still tap into both of those things. So, so from what you see as a challenge, I actually see it as, a, as an opportunity for us to, 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 to kind of play middleman and, and tap into the best of both. How do you do a specific review of the last census, but historically a significant portion of our population drives to Onondaga County to work? It's why we are in that region. So I believe that still persists. So there's, a, there's significant data for how many 
um, household paychecks come back home to Cuyahoga County from uh, Nevada. Rob, Andrew, um, this is kind of all well, best men in place. It looks like you've got a great plan to move forward. How do you move forward? I mean, what's your goal? The, the, the things that you want to start developing, what are the, what is the, the, the board telling you that they want uh, the folks to be on, you know, uh, in the immediate future and then obviously the long term? So the measuring stick is going to be different depending upon who you talk to. But as organizations, that's going to come out strongly in our strategic planning process that we're that we're very hopeful we're going to be able to do. Right now we're um, we, we submitted an application to the Central New York Community Foundation uh, which has dollars available for these type of, of collaborations, consolidations, joint venture type activities. And if we're funded we're going to be able to go out and, and really do a facilitated process of saying okay what you know what what are those goals and benchmarks organizationally speaking. Um, I think if you probably ask the county and the city, those benchmarks are jobs. Those benchmarks are investments. Those benchmarks are, are we growing the tax base? Are we, you know, are we mitigating those calls that we got in February of last year from uh, Dykin about the closure of the McQuay facility? Are we mitigating some of those things? And some of the challenge to that is, is that that's really hard to measure sometimes. You know, um, you know, Sue can sit here and tell you that that grant was able to do that, but most of the time there isn't that direct line. Um, so, you know, that's going to be one of the challenges that the board has to answer is, how, how do we measure that success or as an organization? Um, and ultimately, we've got to be able to bring that case before the legislature, before the city council, as we continue to look to the future of CETA. Um, you know, right now, we've got a contract for this year, um, for 2014. Uh, and it was funded through a line item in the budget, which means that we'll be right back where we were in October of last year, having the same dialogue with the county in another challenging budget cycle. Um, you know, how do we continue to maintain the work of economic development? And, you know, from an organization's perspective, and me as executive director, we better be doing the work. Um, if we're going to, if we want to make that argument, we better be doing the work. Can I follow up on Dan, President's question? You say you're a one-stop, but if the city of Auburn still has its own organization for economic development, how are you a true one-stop? So, and I'm your friend, by the way. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks, pal. Friends like me. Well, it's a, it's a question. No, and it, it's a valid point. The, the reality of it is, is that we really we want the city to be at the table. We want the city to be a partner here. But the Cuba County IDA has the legal authority to do deals within the city of Upper. So as of right now, if somebody comes to CETA and says, we are looking for a project, we don't have to say, well, if you want to go in the city, we've got to go talk to the Auburn IDA. We want to move forward quickly with the Auburn IDA and provide staff services with them so that we can use those appropriate vehicles. And also, they know, and, and the CCIDA knows, is that we want to begin conversations once we're doing that staffing services about we really only need one active IDA in Cuba County. We don't need two that are, that are active and moving forward. And, and so, while we may maintain that structure in terms of the Auburn IDA because it provides some sources and uses, we may use the Cuba County IDA as the vehicle. We don't know. That conversation may be the Auburn IDA is going to look at these particular projects and CCIDA will these particular projects. That's all the conversation we have. But as of now, we, we have those sources, we have those tools in place that we can provide assistance to, to a business no matter where they're looking from. You also have in the block in your organizational chart, you don't have to look at that, but you do have, uh, Ms., uh, you have Tracy, who's one of your employees for CETA. It looks like you have two new spots. What are you hiring? So we have two uh, new job creations that were uh, were brought online as a, as a result of you know, wanting to be a one stop and needing to to staff accordingly. Um, that is a economic development specialist and a business development specialist. Um, that's fancy speak or, or or generic speak for someone who's going to be focusing on what I mentioned before those those visitations, building that database, the retention and expansion activity of the existing businesses figuring out exactly what's going on with the businesses. And this isn't just showing up and making sure you have the name of the CEO right. I mean, this is really doing a deep dive with these businesses and saying, you know, where are some of your challenges? How can we help you? And, and having someone who's knowledgeable enough to ask the right questions that maybe the business owner hasn't been asking themselves up to that point. The business development specialist is going to be focusing on the entrepreneurial assistance, so it's new venture creation, as well as the, as the attraction. Um, and, and, and marketing piece, working with our regional partners uh, in terms of there's a, there's a great initiative right now that's going on where we're actively as a region trying to attract Canadian companies from just north of the border here to come down 
uh, and, and, and expand or relocate into central New York. Most of them are, are looking at how do we get into the American market for some of our products. Um, and, and it's easier to do it when you're actually making them there in some respects. So we're working with that and we'll continue those kind of activities. Can I back up just to sure, your question? Andrew works closely with Jenny and her staff. Yeah, no, it, 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 you know, even when even when we had alphabet soup, I will say that during round one of the CFAs, um, when when things were were still kind of in their separate, I won't even use the word silos because it didn't feel that way. There was tremendous collaboration in this community working together, um, which allowed us to, on the on the face of things, from from the regional council's perspective, actually be working coordinatedly. And it was it was only part way through the process when some people were asking some questions about it that they didn't realize that we weren't. Kind of in one house to us. And I want to point out again that um, there's still an advantage of having two IDAs because it provides more bonding authority for the whole community. With one, we reduce our uh, ability to bond. That has been this, what's historically happened. It's the case right now. So we really don't want to have just one right now because we have more opportunities for more projects to use the bonding abilities. As I said, there are advantages. Mr. French, uh, Go back to the two new positions. How are you going to form this organization? So, um, the, 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 <laughs> the economic development activities, which is where those two new hires are coming from, uh, has a contract with the county right now, as I said. It's a $250,000 annual contract to be a one-stop for economic development. Um, it's in the budget this year. We have a contract that goes year to year. Um, Ultimately, what we would like to see, and this is no secret to anybody, is we want to see a, a multiple year contract, not a, not a year to year, uh, because it makes it very difficult to do business. And we've had discussions and we'd like to see, because one of, there's two reasons why we'd like to see it funded this way. We'd like to see it as a percentage of sales tax, um, because A, it's, it's not a part of the budget discussion in the budget process, um, and so it's not that they can't take it away and undo it, but it's more of a resolution process, which means it goes through committee, which means a little more time as opposed to a line item in the budget, which up until December 17th of this last year, we really didn't know what our funding was going to be. Um, that could have changed on the floor the last night of the legislative meeting. Um, and that's not a that's not a good situation for, for an organization like this to be in when you're working with projects and suddenly your, your funding is reduced and your key person that's been working with that company now has to be let go and that company goes, well, your community isn't really that invested in my coming there because you're, you're not even helping the support staff. So um, we'd like to see a fund as a percentage of sales tax. The other issue is, is that you know, sales tax as it stands right now with the city's preemption is, is somewhat of a barrier to economic development because it does make a difference to the municipalities where, of where a business locates because the sales tax that's generated from that business or from the purchase of the employees in that business, um, it makes a difference whether it's in the city or outside of the city. If it's in the city, the city gets their 2% and the other 2% goes to the county. If it's outside, the city doesn't see any of it, but if it's inside, none of the rest of the municipalities see any of it. We really need to be in a situation where a rising tide floats all boats and it's, just not, it's not currently set up that way. last question we're going to have is one of the programs you did talk about as a favorite to many people here is Leadership Can You Go? You are not doing it in January. What is the new plan for those who don't know? And this is something that our the Wednesday morning roundtable board wanted to talk about. So that's the last question. So Leadership Cuba normally would be into its second month. We've been doing it for 25 years. We start in January and end in June. But um, through a lot of discussion with the board and, and folks who sent people through Leadership Cuba, we decided to change it up. We've expanded it so that it begins in September and runs until June of the following year. However, the time outside of work is pretty much the same. It's going to be one full day a month. So we're going to be kicking it off the weekend of September 12th, I think, and it's going to be a retreat at Casa Wasco, as usual. So we're going to begin uh, recruiting for the Leadership Cuba class of 2014-15, hopefully within another two weeks. So. I have a list started. I have 21 people on the list. Now, some of the people are just making inquiries. Um, so please contact me or call Chrissy at the chamber. Get your name on the list. As soon as we have the collaterals printed, I'm going to send them out, and we're going to start rolling uh, admission. We're excited about it. Um, so we are going to have a few new programs, and we're working hard with the uh, advisory council to beat them up. So any questions about that? 
And this is Judy Kenford. Oh, this guy. <laughs> Put her on the spot. So. Yeah, we want to uh, thank uh, both the Judy Ken, but we want to thank uh, Fish uh, and members of uh, his team uh, for making the presentations. Uh, before finishing, uh, two kudos here that should be said. Well, Andrew Fish is the executive director of both organizations. Uh, over the last year and a half, he's had really two people uh, uh, who have done this on a volunteer basis do a lot of lifting of weight here. And that's Kelly Gridley, who is the CETA chair. And Sue Edinger is the vice chair of, I think, both boards uh, at times. Yes. And so, to both of you, because you're doing this as volunteers, thank you. For all. <laughs> we ask you for a couple things. Uh, one is fill out the uh, reviews that are here. These are your name tags. Uh, we'll be back. I think next month we have the great mystery. You're all going to hear what's going on at the Plaza for the Arts. It's the best kept secret in Auburn right now. Uh, before we go, I'm going to let uh, the Hugo Museum do one shout out. You got a basketball uh, event here when? Saturday. Saturday. This Saturday. We've all got right. the SU Duke game on this TV right here, HD surround sound. Bar will be going. Beer, wine, soda, got some pizza, so come on down. <coughs> Bruce Sherman's the chairman of the board. So, enjoy the rest of your day.